This is Fresh Thinking by Snowden Optero, the podcast where we share ideas from the world of mining and how they apply in industry today. Welcome to episode 41 of Fresh Thinking. My name is Justine Tracy, Principal Consultant at Snowden Optero, and I am joined today by Matt Mullins, who is Snowden Optero's Head of Advisory for Europe, Middle East, Africa and Asia. Matt is talking to us today from London in the UK. Welcome, Matt. Thank you, Justine, and thank you very much for inviting me to share my ideas today. Matt, when did you first become interested in the economics of project development? So uh, perhaps I can go back a step or two before I answer your question. In terms of the minerals industry, it's firstly, it has some unique aspects that sets it aside from other industries in the world. Firstly, it's a we're dealing with an, a wasting asset. We consume our uh, prime asset, which is our ore body, and we have to replace it. So just to stand it in one place, we have to uh, develop projects to replace our, our wasting asset. Secondly, it's an industry that is uh, driven by growth. The world demand for minerals uh, increases at a, at a rate roughly proportional to gro global gross domestic product, uh, or about 4% per year globally. That varies per region, but that is about the amount that we need to increase our production rate for a global mix of commodities to satisfy the world's demand. Thirdly, it's a very expensive industry. So the mining industry, depending on how you calculate it, has a market capitalization of say two to three trillion dollars. We spend about 20% of our market capitalization in developing major capital projects. That's not just major capital projects, it's also minor projects, it's a small replacement projects, and it's development projects that we um, have to spend money on. But that is an enormous amount. It's a huge, huge um, amount of our uh, wealth in terms of the industry that we actually have to uh, spend on, on growth. So I've been always fascinated by how do we spend that money? Do we spend it wisely? And most importantly, how do we decide which projects to expend and how do we measure whether those projects are going to be successful? And in particular, I've been fascinated by the economics of project development, particularly what metrics do we use to measure uh, projects? How do we use those met metrics in order to decide projects that uh, will go ahead for construction? Because if you look at the cost of the feasibility study, it's minuscule compared to the cost of the overall development. So you might spend up to 10, 20, 30 million dollars getting to the point where you can have a board decision or banker's decision on developing that project, but that might be fairly small compared to the overall cost of development of the project, which often can run into billions. Yeah, yeah, you're right. So there's a lot of talk around like the project pipeline and the stages and the the accuracy of each of these phases. Is there any one particular um, part of the pipeline which more focus should be um, put on? I don't, I think that's a very good question as well. I, I think there are different aspects of value creation through your project pipeline. So we, we recognise the standard project pipeline in the mining industry from concept study to through pre-feasibility, through feasibility study. I like to think of those as a concept study is all about strategic thinking. Should we be in this commodity? Should we be in this country? Is this the right size for our co company strategy? And, and then I'd like to look at the pre-feasibility study as um, an exercise in divergent thinking. Once you've got a project of interest, you know it's economic, um, you've got to look at the, the, a wide range of ways that you can develop that project. And then I like to see the the feasibility study stage is really that's your that's really where you deliver your value, where you get into the nuts and bolts of how you're going to actually get this project developed um, from an engineering point of view and lock in the value that you have created during the pre-feasibility. I prefer the pre-feasibility um, 
phase to, uh, to answer your question, because in that phase, I see the maximum value creation. If you uh, can imagine an S curve, the steep part of the S curve is where that pre-feasibility sits. So once you've identified a project of interest through a concept study, the pre-feasibility is where you where you create the maximum value. And, and that's why I like it, because that's where geologists and mining engineers come into their own in terms of how can they look at various ways of modeling and also extracting um, the ore from, from a mining point of view from that ore body. Yeah, it's a critical critical part phase actually, because where it's where projects can make or break, right? Yeah. So often we do um, avoid that phase, or we try and shortcut that phase, and it, and often right. to, our, to yeah. our detriment. Um, we, I, I see a many a project that gets into feasibility study where the project team says, "Hang on, we didn't really study these options properly." let's push it back into pre-feasibility study and go and redo that work. Um, I tend to, when people say that they want to uh, push a project, they want to uh, shortcut the pre-feasibility study, or they use terms like foster to market, for example, uh, I, I try and get them, dissuade them from doing that and, and to do the pre-feasibility study properly and to look at various options, yes. So what, what are some of the things that can um, erode the value? So I have what I, I would say the sort of seven fundamentals of, of project success. And, and if you don't do any of those seven reasonably well, um, you, would, you would erode value. And so that's a, that's a very good question as well. And, and it, maybe if I can take you through those seven um, factors very briefly, uh, if I may. Uh, the first first one is really a, it's a, such a fundamental one for projects, and that is single point accountability. Uh, you have to give not only the project leader, but his key reports single accountability for delivery of their particular part of the project. The minute you um, spread that accountability through a number of people, you divert attention and it, it doesn't work. So that single point accountability should also continue through the duration of the project as well. The minute you, you change a project manager or director, you set that project back or keep key reports. Um, so you have to have that continuity of key people. You've also got to have the right people in the project. Um, it's pointless having people who who um, very little experience in projects or actually don't know what the deliverables are. And so you, you need to get those people involved in it. A key one which has really been well established uh, both statistically and practically, practically is the concept of front end loading. The more the concept says that the more you study a project in the right areas, the better you're going to deliver that project. If you cut corners on the project study, it's going to catch up with you when you uh, build that project. The investment optimization as well, there are many, many ways of looking at how to optimize your investment. A lot of that's usually done in the feasibility study stage through value improvement practices or the like, but that is a critical stage for making sure that you've got the optimum investment. A, a well-studied project can retain the investment going forward, but a poorly studied project can never achieve the optimum of investment, going back to the front end loading. And then probably a key one is don't make changes. Um, late changes especially are killers for projects. So if you change the, it's a major aspect like the processing method or part of the processing method late in the feasibility, it's a killer for projects. And one of the things that, that I really specialized in um, in previous companies um, were independent reviews of those projects. It is so critical to have that independent review, review because one of the key things that, that comes into projects is bias. And bias can take hold of a project. By its very nature, a project should have people in it who, who want it to succeed, who are positive about it, who, who really do believe in that project. 
what that does tend to do on the downside is lead to a biased, rosy tinted view of certain aspects of that project. An independent review picks those up and can bring that project back to where, where it should be if necessary. So those, those are my sort of seven success factors. Some of them are more important in some projects than others. But um, if I were to point out one that I think is, is really the most important one in, in a project is, is those independent reviews. Yeah, OK, so the economics of a project is underpinned by the valuation. Could you step through the valuation process or metrics with us? Yes, yeah, so the valuation codes are set out in codes like Valman, Simval and Samval do recognise three different approaches to valuation, and those are basically the historical costs, the comparative approach and the, and the income approach, which is really our, our widely used and well recognised discounted cash flow approach. That is very much just building up a financial model which incorporates all the technical and financial parameters and calculating a cash flow and discounting that at a, at a discount rate chosen by the company, which I'll come to. And you can calculate certain mes metrics for from that uh, discounted cash flow analysis. I, I have far, four prime metrics that I use in conjunction with each other, not individually and not separately, um, to assess a project. And those are really, if I can go through them, the net present value is the first one that I look at. What is the quantum of um, cash discounted back to the present that you're going to add to the value of a company? The, the second one would be the internal rate of return. That really tells you the quality of the, the investment. The higher the internal rate of return, the better. If it's negative, you, one shouldn't do the, the project. The, the third one would be payback period. So that's how long it takes to pay back the cash that you've invested. And one should look at this on a discounted basis, not an undiscounted basis. And the fourth one, which I really like because it, it is a very, very good one for ranking of projects, and that is the capital efficiency ratio. And that is the ratio of the initial investment to the, in, the NPV to the initial investment. Anything over 0 0.3, 0 0.5 should be seriously looked at. Anything over one is a very good investment. How do I determine the production profile? So what discount rate do I use and what price and revenue assumptions do I apply? Uh, Justine, those are, those are three very good questions and ones that I'll answer separately. The production profile is the key driver of value in, in a financial model. And that's where the geologists and the mining engineers come together with the metallurgists to determine, firstly, what is the, the ore that I'm going to have available for mining? How do I actually mine it and schedule it? And how do I actually process it and recover it? And those key assumptions in your financial model are really the key drivers of, of overall value. We spend a fair amount of our um, activity in a project in making sure that we get those reasonably close, remembering that they are estimates. In every aspect of that uh, process, we are working with estimates. We're not working with actuals, and so we need to understand that risk is involved and uncertainty. That tends to get ignored as we go down the line. When we look at a final net present value number, we look at it as an absolute number, and we should always remember that it's actually an estimate. In addition, though, the, the choice of discount rate and price and revenue assumptions is critical to actually getting to the to the final numbers or range of numbers in a, in a financial valuation. The discount rate really should be based on the company weighted average cost of capital, plus or minus a, a country risk premium, and some people like to incorporate a project risk premium in that as well. I'm not a great fan of using the project risk premium. I believe that project risk should be incorporated in the fundamental building blocks in the financial model, like the, in the production schedule. Revenue, we, we tend to be fairly 
uh, lacks on revenue assumptions in terms of price. So we don't, uh, so we use a flat, for example, price going forward that often is, has very little basis in, um, in analysis, but is what the company's view is. We should really be basing future um, price assumptions on industry analysis uh, from banks and from analysts themselves and look using very much forward curves and a forward view of the, of the price based on the industry consensus. One of the things that I do see in, in financial models that uh, are often lacking is on the revenue assumptions, we tend to either ignore or downplay the amount of cost that it takes to market the actual product. And that's in particular for bulks and base metals. And that's something that I always look for in a financial model. Matt, so after all this, what sort of rate of returns should I expect? I think that's an excellent question as well. That's, everyone has their own view on this, and so I will just give you my view. And it's, it's a view based on what I've seen in the industry and what I've been personally involved in. I tend to see Brownfields expansions as being very, very highly value accretive. And internal rates of return that have published in the industry can be anything from 20% up to 100% or even more. Greenfields expansions, on the other hand, especially the high capital Greenfields uh, projects, tend to have lower internal rate of return and often only between, say, 10 and 20%. Um, that's, a, that's a very broad generalization, but that's what, what I've seen in my experience. So thank you. What further reading would you recommend our listeners for more information on increasing economics of project development? We will put the information in our show notes, which you'll be able to find on snowdenoptero.com. You can also subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher and Google Podcasts. Thanks a lot for joining us, Matt, and sharing all your experiences.